If you're looking for a supercar around the £180,000 mark, you're pretty well catered for. For that price, you'll get a Lamborghini Mercha Largo. Or an Aston Martin Vanquish. And if you're aiming to spend over £300,000, again, there's no shortage of choice. What with your Pagani Zondas, McLaren SLRs and Porsche Carrera GTs. But there's a problem. You see, our office is constantly flooded with letters from viewers saying they want to spend £235,000 on a car. This is this week's batch. Uh, dear Top Gear, £180,000 is too cheap. I'd like to buy a car that costs £235,000. Uh, here's another one. Dear Top Gear, £300,000 is too much. When will you experts realise I want to spend £235,000? Dear Top Gear, I want to spend £235,000 on a car, etc, etc. They all go on in the same vein. And that's a gap that's not been filled until now. This is the little scamp. It's called the Ascari KZ1, and it's a brand new supercar that costs... Yep, you guessed it. Now, at first glance, it has all the right ingredients. It's fast, it's low, the door count stops at two, and those humongous side vents mean the engine's where it should be, in the middle. So, job done then. Well, actually, no. You see, the supercar world is like an elite club with just a few select names in it, all of which have got that certain something that sets them apart. It's very, very difficult for a new boy to join that club. The first problem is the name. It should have heritage. It should really date back to the Normans. And that's hard when the car's new. Over eight seconds. 60 happened well over four seconds ago, and it's claimed the Ascari will hit the supercar holy grail of 200 miles an hour. So, it has the required performance, and there are two good reasons for this barnstorming turn of speed. First up, the engine is this five litre V8. Formed from the BMW M5, only retuned to give 500 brake horsepower. It's brutal. It sounds metallic. And secondly, there's not much to hold it back. The body is made of carbon fibre. The chassis is made of carbon fibre. So it's incredibly light. In fact, this thundering great monster is half a ton lighter than the McLaren SLR. Obscure cars made in small numbers on industrial estates are often let down by cheap and shabby interiors. Open the door and you enter a world of nasty glue and Ford Escort switching. Not so in here. All of this switch gear is bespoke to the Ascari. It's certainly not a collection of bits they found in the wheelie bin outside someone else's factory gate. So far, so good. But we're not out of the woods yet, because a good supercar has to handle well. Now, the basic car comes set up for a little bit of understeer. That's a bit safer, because Class Svart, I think, rightly observes that people's driving skill doesn't necessarily increase with their wallet size. As demonstrated here by Britain's premier supermarket, Ribbon Cutter. In the main, though, this is a very easy supercar to drive. There is no traction control, nothing electronic. In fact, the only thing keeping me on the track right now, and it's certainly not talent, is grip. Just unbelievable grip. How's it staying? I should be over there. How am I still on the track? Do it again. Turn in. I'm not being an idiot now. Now, right now, I should be in those trees where my eardrums have gone, but no. 
top of that, the steering talks to you like it should, and the ride is, for a supercar, superb. You can tell there's a real depth of engineering in this car. So the Ascari has the power, the handling, the fit and finish, and the technology that all supercars must have. Surely then, its entrance into the supercar club is guaranteed. Uh, no, sadly. You see, there's only one name that's managed to join the supercar club in recent years, and that's the Pagani Zonda, which did it by being as mad as a brush. The Ascari is just too sensible. It's too much the engineer's car. What they should have done is let the engineers do their thing and then give it over to a ten-year-old kid with a bag of felt tips to finish it off. You know, draw a few fins and guns on it, all that sort of thing. Because that's the whole point of supercars. Inside every supercar buyer, no matter how many petrochemical companies they own, there is a ten-year-old kid. It's kid stuff. It's obvious. to point out that you did forget one very, very important fact. What? It's British. Well, I mean, it's named after an Italian racing driver. Uh, the company that builds it is owned by a Dutchman and it has a German engine. I know, but it was engineered in Britain and it's built yeah. in Banbury. And if you look in your road atlas, I think you'll find that's in Surrey. Oxfordshire. <laughs> Oxfordshire. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> the other point I was going to make is that if you look at all these supercars at the top of our power board here, you will see that it is utterly dominated by Italians, Germans, Americans, the Swedes, for Pete's sake. Oh, that's true, that's true. So this is, in fact, quite an opportunity for us to get a British car up there towards the top of the board. I mean, obviously, I don't think it needs to go too high up the power board there, maybe too bad. There would be fine. Any higher and it's just a waste, if you ask me. <laughs> um, this is clearly a matter of national importance, and so, uh, well, we're not being biased, but if you take a look at our racetrack as it is at the moment, you'll see it's a little bit damp, a bit moist, so we'll, we'll maybe let it dry out a bit and we'll do the lap in this car later on. <laughs> <laughs> 